Yeah. 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 And the first item on the agenda then is uh, apologies. And uh, I note here that uh, Jay Kelly has indicated that he may be unable to attend. Uh, and uh, the chairperson has indicated that he hopes to join the meeting uh, by 1.15 approximately. Uh, are there any other apologies? Okay, in the event of there no other apologies, can we move on? That uh, say all members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests before and during each committee meeting. So, does any member have any interest to declare? None. Uh, so, to the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of December, to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of December, which are pages 21 to 24. Uh, are members content with the minutes? Okay. And the minutes then can be signed. I'm sure when the uh, chair is physically present, he'll deal with that item. Uh, any matters arising? Okay. Uh, refer members to the draft note of the informal strategic planning meeting, which was held on the 24th of March. Uh, pages 6.1 to 27 and 28 of the members pack and are we uh, content to approve the note Great. and members to second sorry was someone going to add something there no to second to briefing at 6.2 pages 29 to 30 of the members pack remind members that at the informal strategic planning meeting on the 24th of March, members considered a list of possible work topics for the committee to take forward during the remainder of this mandate. Three topics were selected for further consideration. Given the limited length of time remaining in this mandate and associated resource constraints, the intention is that further scoping work will be carried out on the topics groups prioritised at this meeting resulting in a body of preliminary research evidence and possible review terms of reference for the next ERC to progress. To help uh, inform prioritisation, it was agreed that initial scoping work should be undertaken in relation to the progression of each. So could I ask the Senior Assistant Clerk to outline the initial scoping work that has been carried out and the proposed next steps? Okay. Just wait for broadcast to bring me in. Okay. okay. Um, I have on the there seems there to be an issue here. I'm just going to turn my system off and see if that helps. Okay, that seems to be yeah. it. Um, so as the Deputy Chairperson has outlined, I have undertaken some initial um, scope and work in re relation to each of the three topics, um, just to help inform further consideration and prioritisation. So I'm going to work through them in order. So topics 10 and 12 deal with the, the committee system, the effectiveness of the committee system and the collaboration between committees and between committees and the executive. You can find um, this at page 31 of your pack. So we already established that um, it is within the AER, AERC remit. Um, I identified the potential stakeholders at this stage, the, the chairpersons liaison group, committee members and executive ministers. And of course, you know, this is a very topical um, area because it relates to a uh, recommendation, the RHI report, which recommended that the Assembly should consider steps to strengthen its scrutiny role. So I've looked to see who is considering um, these issues. Um, CLG has actually carried out and is in the midst of carrying out um, quite a bit of work in relation to improving scrutiny uh, uh, in committees. It's agreed a strategic priority to bring uh, forward recommendations to, to improve pre- and post-legislative scrutiny, um, and, and that's in direct response to the RHI recommendation. So 
some of the work that has been undertaken already. There was a workshop with Clark clerking staff to generate ideas for improvement. Uh, a questionnaire was issued to members to ask how scrutiny practices could be enhanced. Uh, there was also learning captured from a, a session held during the PAPON conference about the challenges, not specific in relation to scrutinising secondary le legislation. And the CLG has also commissioned uh, research on pre and post legislative committee practice in other legislatures. So before the summer recess, the CLG um, hopes to draw up. Sort of talk about potential practical solutions, so an action plan um, of solutions that could be adopted within committees um, to strengthen that pre and post uh, legislative work. So we have that evidence base from the CLG already. So when looking to see what the committee might want to do, uh, it might want to request details of CLG's agreed work plan in relation to the pre and post legislative scrutiny, and then the the, the art committee. Uh, might want to consider you know, where it can help CLG and progress in the matter. Um, so once um, the ART gets the information from CLG, you could then consider commissioning your own research in any areas that, that aren't covered um, by CLG. Um, in relation to the, the next topic groups, we then move on to uh, the issue of designations. Um, so, scope and the removal of the designations requirement uh, to be replaced by uh, a requirement for weighted majorities on defined key votes or in situations where if a reform petition of concern has been invoked, and consideration of the method of appointing the first and deputy first ministers, as well as the titles to reflect the joint and equal nature of the office and the, the principle of partnership. So we've already established that, yes, it is within the statutory remit of, of this committee. Um, when looking at potential stakeholders, um, academics, parties and independent members of the Assembly and other political parties who are registered here. Um, so, and the basis for, the, for this topic in terms of the rationale behind this, these areas being submitted is that there's a view that designation is outdated and an undemocratic form of government that can result in gridlock and the holding up of important decisions. So I've had a look around and I don't think it's being considered by another body. That's not to say academics aren't writing about it, but I can't find another body that, that is dealing with that. So the existing evidence base, we have those AERC reports um, that have already done work in this um, this area, and of course the, the, there was no consensus there. Um, Trevor Rainey's report just might touch on some of those issues, but but it's not clear yet, and I, I don't actually know the answer to that. So, um, the, in terms of next steps, in liaison with research, um, the committee might want to identify academics as potential expert witnesses and try to get experts with a range of views, and then. Once that research, um, well, or sorry, once we have that evidence, it, it could be analysed, and then consultative questions could be issued to political par parties to, to to gather views on specific issues. Also, the the next um, measure, or the next group of topics, apologies, was to address underrepresentation of women and minority groups in the political institutions. Uh, review actions and research and the introduction of legislation on gender quotas and uh, looking at diversity imbalances across the, the Assembly as a whole and in particular imbalances in, in some committees. So we've already established again that it's within the statutory remit of this committee. There was one issue though in relation to topic 24 which is the diversity imbalances across the, the Assembly. Um, we would need to get some sort of clarification um, from the, the first and deputy first minister who actually submitted that topic. You know, is diversity referring to party representation? Um, because the provisions and standing orders regarding the composition of committees is the responsibility of the committee of procedures, and if it's referring to gender balance, um, the matter would be for the parties. Um, so potential stakeholders, there's actually quite a lot of work going on in relation to this at the moment. There's the, the Assembly's Good Relations Group, 
There's the Assembly Commission, the Assembly Women's Caucus, uh, relevant committees, all party groups, parties and independent members of the Assembly, executive ministers and external stakeholders such as the BAME groups. So, I mean, there's no explanation needed as why this is a, is a topical issue. But in relation to what others are doing about this, the group that's developing the Assembly Good Relations Action Plan is going to hold a stake or a number of stakeholder events with marginalised groups. So that's people from BAME origin, uh, different religious backgrounds and people with a disability, and not specifically women, but obviously they will be included in those groups. And they're actively seeking views um, on what information would be most useful to elicit from these groups um, and covering a range of issues. Um, so the, the Commission is liaising with the Women's Caucus on progressing issues relating to the underrepresentation of women and minority groups in the political institutions and the Committee on Procedures is considering um, proxy <coughs> voting in relation to maternity leave and the Commission is also doing some work um, at the issue of maternity cover. So we don't have a huge evidence base at the moment that we'll, we'll have access, but if, if we carry out a stock take, we, we might have a better evidence base. So in terms of next steps, um, seek clarity from ministers on what is meant by diversity in the context of the, as already outlined, diversity and balances across the, the Assembly, and that's addressed in the draft letters that I'll talk about after this. Um, Commission and issues paper and draft questions for submission to the Assembly's Good Relation Group to help gather evidence to support ARC's consideration of the issues and then hopefully we would then be able to submit um, questions for the groups. Uh, I conduct, and as I said, I mean, I mentioned a whole raft of work that's taken place, but we don't know for certain um, what who else is doing um, work. So I'm suggesting that we conduct a stock take of the work being carried out by all of these groups. And then once that stock take has been completed, we can look at commission comparative research and what's happening in institutions and other jurisdictions. Um, I mentioned there about the draft letters. Um, it's intended then that the committee writes out after following this meeting and consideration on, on priorities and or priorities and prioritisation of those priorities and um, to issue letters uh, to those who submitted topics. So a, a, number of the, a number of the letters are standard, simply advising what the committee has uh, selected as its priorities and, and the priority order. However, if you'll see the letter to the speaker um, at page... Hmm, I'm not sure what... But the letter to the speaker... Um, in your pack, it's attached as Annex D to that paper. Um, it's uh, advising the Speaker of the Great Strategic Priorities, and perhaps to express a view. Um, sorry, I, I should really go back and tell you what the letter was about. Where um, the, the Speaker had referred a letter from Lord Canoul, who is chair of the House of Lords European Union Committee, uh, in relation to interparliamentary relations and scrutiny of the protocol. Um, now, the committee had looked at this in its informal strategic planning meeting, um, and specifically, they were looking at sort of joint working to design a model for scrutiny of the implementation of the protocol, but it wasn't selected. So it's suggesting that the committee goes back to the speaker, advises what the, the strategic priorities are, and given the role the Committee for the Executive Office has in scrutinising EU issues, as the Speaker himself acknowledged in his letter, um, suggesting that the matter might be referred to that Committee for consideration. Um, the next letter is in relation to the First, is to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. <coughs> um, I've already mentioned this about seeking clarity on um, what is meant by diversity. Um, also a letter to the Green Party, it's the last sort of different one, um, where they had, the Green Party has suggested a work steam to review the adequacy and effectiveness of the statement of entitlements. So that letter really is just saying, look, we're taking this work forward um, with Trevor Rainey um, and to advise them that we have sent their submission to Trevor Rainey. Um, 
for consideration uh, as part of the review. So there are a number of draft letters there, but the ones I've highlighted are the ones that, that are just um, a bit uh, more complicated than, than the standard ones. Okay. Is that you, Ray? That's me, yes, Deputy Chair. Yeah. And uh, just do we have any questions that m m members wish to put to Mary and uh, listen to her report? And now do we seek just approval for the sending of those letters? Yes. Well, do we not? We need to agree the, the priorities Priority. and the, um, the priorities and the, the order of those priorities. So the committee needs to consider and agree the priority for the topic groups, um, yeah. consider and agree the next steps that I had outlined, and then consider and agree the draft letters to those who submitted possible topics on the, on the basis of, of what you decide. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, the priority order of the topic groups then. Um, do we have suggestions on that? Sorry, Chair, I was trying to get in there to ask Marie a quick question, um, but I was put on mute and I couldn't unmute myself. Um, could I possibly ask a couple of questions? Just um, the just going back to topics 10 and 12, mm -hmm. CLG and, um, are obviously doing the work that they're doing at the moment. Um, I have to say, can we ask a question and clarification about the work that is being done? Because the questionnaire issue to members, I haven't seen that. I don't know how far along they are with that work. Um, there's a also an issue whereby committees cannot currently meet because of Starleaf. There just isn't enough um, wherewithal there within Starleaf to allow committees to scrutinise, having been through quite a significant piece of legislation through the Department of Communities. Um, it has been quite astounding how many times that we have not been able to meet because Starleaf has not been available. Um, so that might be something that we could just check to see if CLG or I actually considering that. Um, the other one I wanted to ask about is on the issue of designations. I know you've talked about academics and that would be very welcome. Um, Human Rights Commission, there is actually an issue about human rights and the lack of um, the ability for people, and particularly those who are of certain designations, uh, to have political representation because when a vote is taken, their, count, or their vote isn't counted in the same way that others are. So I'm just wondering if we could consider that as part one of the potential stakeholders. And then finally, on topics 22, 23 and 24, who are the Northern Ireland Good Relations Group? And is anybody actually going to ask the MLAs themselves that are currently in existence about the underrepresentation of women and minority groups? Um, it was done in the past, and I have to say, the shocking thing is that because we are not employees, nobody, nobody records evidence about the diversity within the MLA group that there currently is. Um, so how can we say that there's complete underrepresentation when we don't actually know? Apart from looking at someone and saying, well, we're assuming you're a man and you're a woman, um, the disability audit is anonymous. Um, there's very little that is, is being recorded about MLAs. We have no Section 75 records done. Um, so I'm just wondering if that good relations group, who they are and if they're actually even looking. They may well look outside, great, but... What about internally as well? Okay, if I just address your, your, your comments then, uh, in relation to 10 and 12, the committees, you asked about the questionnaire um, issue to members. Um, I mean, as far as I, I mean, I've been given this information by um, the, 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 the team that looks after CLG as such, um, but I can certainly ask that question, you know, when that questionnaire was issued. It um, was issued. I got one. You got one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I, but I can check that out for you anyway. Um, we can also ask CLG about um, the Starleaf capacity, because it's a capacity yeah. issue. Um, but I think now, my own understanding is that um, if somebody is vir beaten virtually now, totally virtually, um, they don't need to be assigned to a room, I think, and that was that was a, an issue with Starleaf. I, I don't know the, the full technical details, but it's certainly something I can seek clarification on. In relation to 26 and 27, about the potential stakeholders, um, certainly, if, if the committee agrees, we can add human rights into that um, as a potential stakeholder. 
um, in relations to topics 22, 23 and 24 about the Assembly Good Relations Group. Um, the answer to that is I am unclear um, who comprises that group. I'm assuming it's um, a STEM Assembly um, officials, but I can certainly check that out. Um, and I can pass on, if the committee wishes, comments about um, MLAs um, and how they're being consulted uh, as part of that group's work. Have I missed anything there? No, that's perfect. Thank you, Brian. Do we have any other comments? Yeah, Deputy Chair, could I comment? In terms of prioritising the groups, it seems to me that the first group, namely topics 10 and 12, there's already work going on about that with the CLG. It seems the same with the third group, topics 22, 23 and 24. There's work going on there, but the one area where there seems to be no work going on of any significance is the topics 26 and 27. Therefore, I would have thought we should make that our number one priority. I'd so propose. Okay. Any other comments? So do we take that as a proposal? Yes, I'm proposing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and do we need a seconder for the proposal? No. No. Uh, so, Maria, is due to take that on board then? So I'll take that on board. And just to check that members are content that um, we also, with the potential stakeholders, will contact the human rights as part of that. And um, the next steps that I have outlined about identifying the academics and obviously human rights will be in there as potential expert witnesses. And then we can take the work from there once we, once we get that evidence. So if members are content, we'll, we'll work ahead on that basis. Okay. Are members content? Okay. And then our next step is outlined. Uh, agree the draft letters. Do we need a second priority? No. 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 If if um, the committee has decided that you know that those three um, priorities were identified for further consideration, right, okay. you don't yeah. need to yeah. Yeah. select okay. the three and put them in order. You know, if okay. if you want just the yeah. one and yeah. work ahead with that, that's that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Agreed. Right. And now is it the case of once again you think I'm in a hurry to get to this, but uh, uh, about uh, draft letters? Great. Great. Okay. And uh, that uh, that for this scoping work will be carried out on the prioritised topic groups and letters will be issued to those submitted. Possible topics. Uh, so we move on to the next item on the agenda. Item seven, progress report on the review of opposition entitlement uh, by Trevor Rainey. So is Trevor in attendance or is he in, in attendance by Starleaf? Yes, Chair. Uh, Good afternoon, Deputy Chair. I think I've arrived in your room. Yeah. If you can hear me clearly, I hope. Yeah, I can indeed. I thought you wrote. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Pleasure to be with you. I, I do have a few slides, which I think the staff were going to try and share on screen. And those slides are the same as the slides that are included in your pack. So hopefully you'll have had a chance to have scanned through them. So I'll, just by way of introduction, Chair, thank you for the opportunity to undertake this review and for the opportunity to meet today. I am proceeding on the basis that the purpose of our, our discussion today is really for me to give you a, an update on progress and just further to the uh, written report I've given you a, a couple of weeks ago. And then I want to highlight some emerging issues from both the research and the consultation. Not that I'm going to give any view today on those uh, issues, uh, nor uh, am I expecting the committee to debate them today, but just to flag up 
those that are being uh, uh, sort of raised with me and emerging in the research. And then I suppose the primary purpose is that the final slide when I get to it is really for the committee to mention to me any issues that uh, I have missed or that are not on that emerging issues list to make sure that I have covered everything and considered everything uh, during uh, the review. So this slide uh, entitled Progress Update on, in respect of the research, uh, Deputy Chair, I've been able to get good access to uh, the archives in the Assembly, if I can put it in those terms, previous work of the ARC committee and of uh, researchers, and that has been very helpful. I have had academics and uh, think tank uh, representatives in contact with me and vice versa, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but that has uh, been uh, helpful in some respects. I've been looking at benchmarking both internationally and more locally, particularly the parliaments in the UK and Ireland, and then in terms of international models, trying to identify any that might have learning for us under one or two examples, albeit they are somewhat limited in their uh, usefulness. In terms of consultation, I've, uh, the process of consultation with political parties and independent MLAs is ongoing. I hope perhaps to have concluded it by now, but uh, we're, we're getting there, I think, and I hope in the next number of days to have the final response in, and I'll keep urging that uh, to be the case. I have met with the Procedures Committee and with the Speaker. I offered to meet with the Assembly Commission, as was suggested in my uh, terms of reference. Uh, the Commission feel at this stage that there really isn't anything useful that they can contribute beyond what their individual parties are contributing to the review through their party responses, and they're content to wait until uh, the report is completed and then consider any issues which are relevant uh, to its area of work. I've also, the Deputy Chair, had the opportunity to chat with David Natzler, uh, Sir David Natzler, the former Clerk and Chief Executive of uh, the House of Commons in Westminster, and you'll recall the committee had granted uh, approval for me to do that, and that was a useful discussion. And I've also had contact at executive le level, in the, or official level, in the executive office in terms of uh, a reference to trying to make some comparators between the support of ministers and the support of uh, the official opposition in the Assembly. And moving to the next slide, Deputy Chair, I just want to highlight uh, emerging issues under three headings. Firstly, a few general issues, and then I'll focus on procedural issues and resource issues. The first of those to mention is the scope of the review. Uh, the scope of the review is relatively narrow in terms of looking at the uh, existing entitlements for the official opposition, both procedural and resource uh, in nature. Uh, but obviously that sits within a wider framework of uh, the Good Friday Agreement settlement about the principle of opposition, power sharing, coalition government. And there may be some issues there where I might make uh, observations rather than recommendations where I feel that it might be out with the scope of my review, but there are issues that have been raised and I'll certainly make reference to those. I think a consistent theme emerging is the tension, if I can use that word, between the consociational system of government, which is to hunt based on an official opposition, and the, the idea of power sharing where all parties are working together against the more traditional model of democracy, which is a, a government and opposition, and that brings its own peculiarities and idiosyncrasies, which will have to be weighed up in the midst of the report and its recommendations. I mentioned that I had some contact with academics and think tanks. However, I think it's fair to say that, and all the academics acknowledge this, there is very little research around opposition, and more particularly, very little research around the entitlements of oppositions in Parliament. So it has been a struggle to uh, find useful uh, uh, resources there and, and input. I have uh, interestingly made contact with an academic in the University of Manchester who specialises in opposition, and uh, there is in the University of Bolton a centre for opposition studies, and I've had a couple of useful meetings uh, with their staff. 
The purpose of the official opposition has been raised with me uh, in a number of discussions, and that really is trying to identify what is the role of the opposition, its purpose within the Northern Ireland Assembly, to be able then to assess what resources it requires, and uh, bringing some clarity to that, I think, is important in, in my report. And the final uh, point to mention here of a general nature is the role of the political parties and independent MLAs who do not qualify for uh, official opposition status. And uh, this really brings in the issue of the criteria or eligibility to be classed as the official opposition and to qualify, for example, for funding under the FAP scheme. And there are examples in other places of technical groups, be it in uh, the Doyle in Dublin or the European Parliament. And I know that has been explored in the past and discussed, but it's one of the issues that has been raised and is in the, the mix as well. If I could move to the next slide on emerging issues procedural. And as part of the uh, relating and benchmarking with other parliaments, one of the clear things that come through is that there's limited codification, if I can use that term, of opposition entitlements in other institutions. The financial uh, entitlements are very clearly articulated or uh, committed to paper. The uh, official opposition procedural entitlements around uh, speaking rights and so on tend to be largely based on informal agreements or custom and practice rather than a very clear set of uh, codified arrangements. It has been raised with me in a number of places, and this comes back perhaps to the point of technical groups that I mentioned. The proportion of non-government party members getting speaking opportunities and having a way that that voice can uh, be clearly heard within the arrangements for opposition or official opposition. Mention has also been made about the uh, opportunity for the official opposition to access information and briefings from ministers, perhaps in a in a similar way to that which committee chairs uh, uh, enjoy at the moment on particular contentious issues or significant uh, issues. Also around the official opposition allocation of seats and committees and appointments of chairs of specific committees, and I'm thinking here, uh, and it has been mentioned around the Public Accounts Committee, and I know that is part of the provisions of the 2016 Act, which have not uh, as yet been implemented in standing orders, but that's something that has, uh, has come up in the research and consultation. And then interestingly, a point has been made to me about the scrutiny role of backbenchers in government parties, and that role in a mandatory coalition uh, has, uh, is something to, for me to give some consideration to as well. Can I move to the next slide, please? And then looking at emerging issues under resources and the FAP scheme or the Financial Assistance for Political Parties scheme uh, is something which the Assembly Commission have under review at the moment. And I understand they will uh, await the outcome of this review before they finalise any thinking around that particular scheme. But there are issues around the structure of that, that scheme uh, how the, the thresholds are set, the eligibility levels and so on. The actual quantum, in other words, what is the, the value of the funding in total budget terms? And uh, that's an issue to think about. And then I've already mentioned uh, eligibility and, and the qualification criteria. Specific reference has been made in my terms of reference to the funding for offices of the leaders of the official opposition and how that might be approached uh, and whatever administrative research, sports special advisors, for example, that type of thing. And that's another issue that I have under consideration. To put it in context, as always, there's the, the cost of democracy uh, issue in the context of wider public expenditure pressures and the issue of how that balances with the, the overall priorities for public expenditure. Uh, and uh, that's perhaps an issue for others to wrestle with after I have concluded my report and the benchmarking, but it is certainly a factor uh, to, to be careful of. And the final point, just in relation to resources, mentioned as we made it about accessing Assembly Secretariat resources, accessing the research service and the Bill Office, for example, for the official opposition 
and, and that point I will consider uh, as well. And could I move to the final slide? Really, in conclusion, uh, Deputy Chair, I've, I've outlined at a very high level and very briefly the work that's been done. Uh, I am working towards producing the report uh, by the 14th of June and then presenting it to you formally at your meeting on the 23rd of June. But at this stage, just to ask if there are any questions or comments on the report and emerging issues at this stage, and particularly, are there any other issues that aren't captured in that list of emerging issues that I have gone over that members think would be useful for me to consider? And just to emphasize again, Deputy Chair, I'm not expressing a view on any of these issues, nor am I asking the committee for any view on the issues. It's really to be sure that I have a complete list and I'm able to deal with them. <coughs> so thank you for that, Deputy Chair, and happy to take questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Trevor, um, and uh, I think that in uh, your report, it only but sort of uh, highlights to the rest of us the complexities of uh, of uh, the work that you have to carry out at the present time. I wouldn't envy your role not for one second. Uh, I'm also very glad to see that uh, here present now is uh, the actual chair himself of Mervyn Story. So, Mervyn, <laughs> without further ado, can I hand over to you, Mervyn? <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Vice Chair, for your uh, your help and facility. And I'm now vaccinated. I got my second jab there, and uh, now some some people. I, I, I can see you you good already. <laughs> <laughs> some, think, some people might think I need more than a jab, but anyway, uh, uh, Vice Chair, thank you, much appreciated. Trevor, lovely to see you again. Thank you for the work that you're undertaking on the committee's behalf. And can I just um, ask members, is there any any questions that members want to, to raise? Uh, you have now, Trevor, please indicate and uh, carry on. I hope I can see everybody. Uh, Robbie, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, to the other members that were on, you'll, you'll be aware that I was missing. It might have been my fault, but I couldn't find a link. And I know you've agreed something, um, but I wasn't on to agree it. So I'll find out in the minutes what you've agreed to. You've probably, I don't know what you've done. You've probably made me the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party or something. <laughs> we <laughs> wouldn't I'm, be I'm, that cruel. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that Robbie, that was a tied vote. <laughs> a tied vote. And I'm the only, only Ulster Unionist done here. No, um, thank you for that. And thank you, Chair. And thank you, Vice Chair, um, Deputy Chair. But Trevor, just one question. In terms of the time strains, oh, sorry, thanks for your presentation, by the way. And good to meet up with you again here. Um, in terms of the, time strain, uh, the time constraints with regard to your report, and obviously we're in a compressed time battle anyway with the, uh, an election next year. Is there any, um, any trouble on the horizon with that? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Chair, the, uh, the consultation process is still ongoing, and I would uh, dearly encourage uh, all parties to make their submissions, and those who haven't as yet made them uh, will know that is the case, Yes, because I've been prompting them, and I, I would need to get that in within the next week or so. Otherwise, I'll have to draw a line and not take account uh, of their views. Uh, in terms of time frame, uh, uh, Robert, uh, yes, I'm on schedule for the 14th of June uh, to produce a report and then present it on the 23rd of June. You mentioned the elections next year, and uh, obviously this committee and the Assembly and then others such as the Assembly Commission have work to do following that. Whether they accept any or all of the recommendations is another matter, but then they will have to be given effect in differing ways. So. There will be a, a process of work flowing from the report, irrespective of what decisions we made. Okay. Anyone else has a question? No work. Because I can't see. There's some I can't see if they're putting their hand up. So apologies for that. Sure. I think Callie has been trying to get in online, so she probably has a question for you. Yep. Thanks, but Kelly. I don't actually. I was previously. I was trying to get it. Okay, that's okay. Okay, if there's no questions and nobody is, uh, and just see and make sure that I haven't missed anybody. No, chair. There's no uh, hands raised at the moment. All the members are in the spotlight in any event, so uh, they could. That's okay. Okay. Well, listen, Trevor. Uh, again, thank you. We look forward to uh, your presentation then and the final report. 
by the 23rd. Is not right, the 23rd of June. Well, um, I look forward to that, Chair. Okay. And, and uh, I wish you were in person and I can meet with you face to face by that stage. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Trevor. Thank you very much, Chair. Cheerio. Okay. Uh, okay, members, can we then move on to uh, item eight, which is correspondence? And we have correspondence on the Committee of the Executive Office regarding uh, correspondence and committee scrutiny of the common frameworks. That's at pages 64 to 71 of the pack. And this is just for noting, unless anybody has any comment to make. 8.2 is correspondence from the Chairperson's Liaison Group regarding committee consideration of legislation. That's at pages 72 to 77 of the pack. Again, that's for correspondence for noting, unless there's any members would like to go through these. If anybody, Shane, just keep me right if anybody wants to raise a, a query or a question. 8.3, correspondence from CAMS regarding the advice to committees. That's at page 78 uh, of the pack. 8.4 is from the Executive Office regarding uh, the forward work programme and the uh, that's a page at 70, 90, 81 of the pack. And that, again, is for noting and it relates to the earlier agenda item at uh, number six. Then we have 8.5, which is correspondence with the Speaker regarding an independent review of the adequacy and effectiveness of the statement of entitlement for an official opposition. And that is at pages 82 to 87. And again, that related to item six on the agenda. At eight six, we have correspondence from Pat McCartan regarding the new decade, new approach, and just ask members to note the correspondence which relates to the early agenda item number one. The eight seven, it's correspondence from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and that the page is ninety to one hundred and two. And then we have correspondence from uh, Deborah Institute regarding voting procedures. Uh, that's at page 103. Uh, mem uh, and just to advise members that while it's unclear, this correspondence may be directed to the ARC using the names of the chairperson and deputy chairpersons of the procedures committee. So just to ask members if they wish to take up the request for an online discussion on the matter of voting procedures discussion making, or if they prefer just to note the correspondence. Happy to note. No, yeah. Chair, can we maybe pass it on to um, the people who are doing the work on the designations? Because um, these are these are some of the people who we would probably want to have input to that range of opinions coming forward. Okay. Is it possible, Shane, for just to get a, a written briefing on that? Yeah, Chair, if, if the committee's content... Um we can uh, add add this institute to the list of stakeholders for that topic item, and uh, I'll respond just indicating that the committee's done uh, has done that and okay. seek a written uh, paper. Okay, happy enough for that, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Eight point nine correspondence from the member of the public regarding the twenty eleven caravan act. I turn it just as having a caravan, so just it didn't come from me. Uh, I'll just uh, to, for members to note. That brings us to the end of the correspondence. Then item nine is whether we have any other business. Is there any other business that a member wants to raise? Okay, if not, then the time and date of the next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 23rd of June, uh, as advised previously. And with that, can I again thank the Vice Chair for his invaluable help and indulgence and to members for all their help at the committee today and wish you a very enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.